Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rob Canzanieri, and um, I'm the leader of the Data Architecture Virtual Chapter for PASS, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Um, today we have Grant Fritchie, and uh, he's going to give a, a presentation on how to build a database deployment pipeline. I have a real good code here for the PASS Summit coming up. Um, I believe it will save you $150 off the cost of the summit. So uh, you can use this code when you register. And um, you'll get a little, you'll get a discount, which is always good to save some money. Let's see. So, um, Pass Summit is a massive event. It happens once a year, and um, I'm gonna go this year, and um, it's just it's a great event. And if you can come, um, use this code like I was telling you a second ago, and uh, you'll save some money on the event. PASS has a lot of virtual chapters, and um, I want to thank you for coming to this virtual chapter, but um, there might be other chapters that you might be interested in, too, and uh, they have webinars all the time, and there's a lot of them, so feel free to, you know, sign up at the PASS website and, uh, and, and attend them. Now, here's some upcoming SQL Saturdays. Um, one's going to be in Baton Rouge on August 2nd. And I'm actually going to be talking. So if you happen to be in Louisiana or, or around Baton Rouge and you want to meet me, I'm going to give a, um, a session on CTEs, Common Table Expressions, and, uh, and go into recursion and some database administration, how I use CTEs um, to help me in my job. So, you know, it would be great to meet someone, um, you know, from the webinars there. So make sure if you're there, let me know, and uh, it would be great. So, PASS is always looking for volunteers, and if you want to volunteer, just go on their website, and there's always opportunities, and who knows, you might just be leading a, a chapter like me. Um, and last, well, sure enough, my screen's clicked on the wrong button. Let's see if it, let's, oh, well, well that was my last screen. So, um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Grant, so uh, we're going to change it over to Grant. And uh, let's see if, if the transition goes smooth here. And thank you, Grant. Um, we're going to have just one note. The session is recorded, and I'll have a link on my, you know, on the past website to the YouTube video. And we got one hour, and, um, and we're going to definitely, I'll shoot Grant all the emails, I mean questions, through an email at the end of the session. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, Grant. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming out, everybody. Um, this is uh, we're going to talk about uh, doing continuous delivery, or, or at least building towards continuous delivery. Um, here are the goals in the session. Basically, I want to. When I get talking about deployments, um, I, I can kind of get passionate about it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of well known for query tuning, and I'm a real freak for execution plans. But believe it or not, process is something that gets me very, very excited. Um, possibly sometimes in negative ways, but but uh, it's something I've, I've discovered while working with teams, working in large scale environments. It's extremely important, and it, it's amazing how easy implementing tools is and how difficult implementing process is. So hopefully we can cover these goals and get some idea of some of the process changes, both you know in, in terms of tooling, but also to, to your organization that you're going to need to make. Um, never can get that phone turned off properly, so it's going to ring here for a second. We'll just keep going. This is my contact information. My name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software. Uh, I am the scary DBA. And this is my contact information. Please use it. If you've got questions, get in touch, um, let me know anything you've got. That's my, it's my email address, direct, my blog, my Twitter handle, my LinkedIn account. And uh, if you guys want to get in touch, you can hook up with me and, and that's it. I don't do an about me slide. Nobody cares uh, you know, how long I've been working in the business. It doesn't really matter. Uh, real quick, mentioning the PASS Summit, there is a little contest. We're doing a, a fundraiser for Doctors Without Borders. Um, that's a link to it. It's a bit.ly link, uh, WD6JT, lowercase x. And if we get to uh, um, 10K 
Adam Mechanic, Brent Dozar, and myself have agreed to get our pictures taken wearing those rainbow fuzzies that you see there on the picture. So I'm um, kind of excited about this. It's going to be fun. We're, you know, it's, it's for charity, and it's a little bit of fun at the summit. Um, some, summits, you know, it's about serious, hardcore learning, but it's also about community and, and some, you know, a little bit of entertainment, and, and this is one of the things that's coming up. Let's get back this, and let's get going on this stuff. All right. ALM, Application Life Cycle Management. Let's talk about that. It's a, it's, a, it's a Microsoft term. So some of you, if you haven't read a lot of Microsoft tech, uh, uh, books and technology and whatnot, you may not have heard of application lifecycle management, but you just hear the words. Most people get a good grasp of what it is. But let's talk about where the database fits in. Now, there are three basic cores to ALM, to application lifecycle management. We've got to talk about governance, development, and operations. And governance is obviously requirements, information coming in from the business, and the database is central when we're talking about requirements. There's no questions there whether or not a database is going to be part of a requirement or not because your business, most businesses, run on the information it collects, and therefore a database of some sort is probably going to be reasonably central to that process. Now development, obviously there's databases in development. We're going to be building out those databases. You're going to be writing code against them. You may design those databases. You may generate those databases out of an ORM tool. You're crazy if you generate the database, but that's fine. It doesn't matter. Development and the database is still completely hooked into the lifecycle management. And then most people who are database professionals are, are actually database administrators, most, but not all. There's plenty, there's plenty of uh, architects, plenty of you know, administration people and other types of developers, but operations is absolutely a major piece of this. So it's pretty clear databases fit in everywhere across ALM. There's just no separating the database from the application no separating the database from the management, no separating the database from governance. So we can't get away from databases, they're there. And the thing is, is that there's this natural friction that occurs between development and operations. It's just, you know, it, how can we put it? It kind of looks like this, right? Oops, you guys don't need to see that. It kind of looks like this. You really see there's this just, constant friction and it, and it's it's natural you know development to operations operations to development we just kind of don't get along and understanding why is important because it it helps you reach across the divide there should not be a divide frankly but there is one it just happens and the thing is is that development's focus is absolutely on speed as it should be I'm 100% I'm in favor of that. I, I am a DBA. I identify myself as a scary DBA. Um, I'm, I'm hooked into my data-centric life. I, I you know, very much believe in it, but I came out of development. So I've got you know, to <laughs> have a lifelong sympathy for developers. I can't get away from it. And the thing is, is developers have spent decades coming up with more and more mechanisms to allow them to move faster and faster. I mean, as every, anyone's probably heard the phrase, moving at the speed of business, right? I mean, it, it's as business moves fast and development, which creates all the things around business, has to also move fast. And so they've come up with these different mechanisms, lean, iterative, FDD, you know, all managed around getting down the track as quickly as possible. It's about the sprint. It's about the move. And operations, our focus is different. Now, the thing is, it's actually not on production. It's on protection, right? It's not that we care about the production servers per se. It's that we care about what they represent. We care about the uptime. We care about the fact that the systems are there, that they're available, that they can be seen, accessed, controlled, whatever, by the people who need them. It's about keeping that business online. And so our focus is not on speed. We absolutely focus on monitoring. We absolutely focus on data integrity, referential integrity, all kinds of other things. And it's all about management of that data. And it makes us, to be blunt, 
paranoid control freaks. And that's okay, because that's what our job is supposed to be. But there's a real conflict there with development. And historically, databases become a bottleneck for development. And there's three reasons for that. Now, the first one is we've got some weird languages. SQL is strange. I know that you know many of us use it all day, every day. We're totally into it. Um, but it's a strange language. It's, it's structured oddly. You know, you write it in a weird way because you say select and do a listing from some listing of tables, you know, where and some filter criteria. But then it gets turned around inside the processor and you get from these tables where these values are true, select these columns. So it, it, it almost completely rearranges the query in, in ways that are, that are just odd, right? And, and if the logical processing and the language processing were the same, it would, it would make it a more clear language. But, but it is what it is, and we're dealing with it the way we're dealing with it. And things get even worse when we start talking about X query, or we start talking MDX. I mean, these languages are, are odd. They're, they're, they're just outside the norm. They don't function in the same way that development languages function. And it slows things down. It slows down developers. Heck, it slows down DBAs. We have to hop through hoops, too, to deal with this stuff. Also, applications come and go. I mean, I'm not, I'm not throwing rocks at developers or applications, but I worked for an insurance company that had 100-year-old data, 100 years old. The data had far outlived the piece of paper which was the application used to collect it. That data kept going. It was loaded into mainframes back in the 60s, and then it was moved on to some little VAC servers in the, in the early 80s. And um, at some point in the 90s, they, they put it on Oracle. And then in 2000, I fixed it and put it on SQL Server. It's a joke. I'm not knocking Oracle. Anyway, um, the data just keeps going, right? It can't be replaced. And so this is a real hurt, and this causes again, a bottleneck, a slowdown on deployment. And that paranoia, remember I talked about us being paranoid control freaks? Well, that's another part of the slowdown. We have a tendency to stand in front of the developers and say, no, right? What's the DBA's favorite word? No. Our favorite two-word phrase is, it depends. But that's not what we say most of the time. What we say most of the time is, no. And we need to get away from that and start saying, yes, a lot more often. Um, but, but we need to look at some of the stuff I'm going to talk about here because we still have that protection need and we can't get away from that. Now, I am talking about continuous delivery, but I want to make sure that we're really clear about what I mean when I say it. It's not about getting an automatic deployment into your production server. And if it was, I would be standing here saying no, right? It's not. There are three continuous approaches, and we need to break them down. And so what you've got is you've got continuous integration. Continuous integration is primarily a development process, and it works out of source control. You've probably got some type of CI server, and it works within a development sphere. And this is a part of continuous delivery, and it is a continuous mechanism, but it's strictly a development area. It doesn't go anywhere near the test servers. It doesn't go anywhere near production. And so it makes it a very safe thing to implement while being a very good thing. Now we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what continuous integration is a little later. Now you talk about continuous delivery, and continuous delivery is up to production, not into production. Continuous delivery is going to allow us to automate through a development process through a testing process and have at the end of that process a tested artifact that we can then use to go to production. That artifact can be any number of things. It can be a DAC pack if you're using Visual Studio. It can be a NuGet package if you're using Visual Studio or some other third-party tools. It can be a T-SQL uh, script um, depending on what type of tooling you're using. But we will have an artifact at the end of the process that we can test, validate, and then apply to production, not simply roll stuff into production. Now, there is continuous deployment. And if you get really good at your continuous delivery, so you have a high level of confidence in that artifact, you can automate that deployment all the way through production. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. And that's a 
in, in some cases that's an impossible goal. In other cases, it's a really nice to you know strive for goal, but few people are going to hit continuous deployment. And, and many DBAs are, are just frankly freaked by the concept. So I'm going to focus more on continuous delivery, on the concept of getting that tested artifact. I just want to make sure we were level set there. Um, do you have any questions at the moment um, on stuff that we've covered so far? Um, w there's no questions right now. Okay. So um, I, I'm going to mute out, but if I see some, I'll let you know. Okay, great. So the goals here are really simple. What we want is to get fast, fast feedback. You don't want to be waiting until you're ready for the production deployment to be testing. You don't want to be waiting for the production deployment to know how things are going to behave. We want feedback that's immediate. So we're going to, whoops, hit the wrong button. We're going to get our team changes integrated immediately and continuously. That's done, well, we'll talk for a minute about how that's done. We're also going to want to make sure that we've got testing set up, and as much as possible, we're going to automate that testing. A big part of this automation is, is the ability to then rehearse all of our deployments. So we're moving lots and lots and lots of deployments through, and we're not simply relying on that production deployment, or even that final test deployment prior to production to be when we know what's going on. And the whole idea is that this is going to get us a repeatable process because we need a repeatable process in order to be able to work well within a team. It's, it's especially if you're supporting multiple teams um, and, and fre frequently you know data architects, frequently database administrators, frequently database developers are supporting more than one development team. And because of that, automation, automated testing, and a severe process. Process is very important. Those things are going to drive what you do and make things possible for you. Without them, you're going to be you know, stuck. So now we're going to talk about the Toyota production system and Lean. Uh, and I've given this presentation a couple of times, but the first time I gave it, just so you know, was in Detroit. And uh, this slide did not go over well in Detroit, just, just so you know. I mean, it was kind of frowned on. There was, there was vocal questions made, but the whole concept of lean is really cool. Now there is, understand, there is the lean paradigm and there is the lean development methodology. Now I've read through the entire lean development methodology and I am not a fan. So what I'm talking about here today is just the common sense of the lean paradigm. I am not advocating for the lean development methodology. You guys can go look that up if you want. Uh, you can implement it if you want. I think you're crazy, but you're <laughs> welcome to try. But let's talk about just the lean paradigm. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. The whole idea is focus on the customer and eliminate waste. First, you're going to need to know who your customer is, but you focus on the customer. If your customer is the dev team, great. If your customer is the production database and you, and you honestly believe that's your customer, great. That's fine, but you focus on that customer and you eliminate waste. You find ways to make things run faster. You continuously improve. Not, you know, again, common sense. Lean is very much common sense, but it's something that you have to look at, understand, agree with, buy into, and then get your management to buy into it as well. You need to empower the team. Now that may mean getting developers sandbox environments so they can play. Whatever they've got to do, remember, development focuses on speed, let's get them focused on speed. We'll do something else. Optimize everything. Don't simply say, well, I'm going to, op I'm going to query tune, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, but it's all stuff at the end of the pipe. Get involved at the beginning of the pipe. Get involved at the start of the process and optimize the whole thing. Plan for that. Also, plan for change. The fact is, Stuff's going to change. Requirements are going to change. Data is going to change. Data structures, indexes, you know, it's just going to be in constant flux. And so you have to assume that. Automate these processes. You know, the more you can automate, the more you can do. The funny thing is, is that uh, automation, I've, I've just found automation to not be, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny, it, I, I consider it automation to be my best friend in the world. But the funny thing about automation is, is it just gives me more work. 
because what happens is it'll automate a process, so now I can do it faster. Well, so then I just have to do it more. So when I was supporting two and three development teams, I felt overworked. Then I started automating all my deployment processes, and then I was supporting five, six, seven, eight, nine development teams, and oh my God, then I knew what overwork was like. And, and it was just through the automation process that you got that extra stuff in. So you're not going to put yourself out of a job. You're going to make yourself more valuable. And build quality in. I mean, it's, and this is just the lean paradigm. I, you know, it, again, it's common sense. If you said any of this to a given boss, they'd say, yes, of course we do these things. But, but you're going to have to drill down. You're going to have to push on them and say, look, we really want to implement processes around these concepts, not simply pay lip service, but get behind them and start supporting them. So that's all the conceptual stuff. Let's start drilling down a little bit and start, talk about how you get this done. And there's basically four stages. I'm going to reach. I'm going to change these at some point because I'm, I'm rethinking the names on these. We'll, we'll have to. We'll work on it. But anyway, step one is source control, the single hardest step. After that, you're going to start working with some CI fundamentals, continuous integration fundamentals. Then you can get into more advanced CI, and then you can get into fully automated deployment mechanisms. And and generally, these are the process. This is the process that you would go through. These four stages, and the hardest one, the hardest one, is source control. Now, source control is hard because most people don't have green fields. A green field is a brand spanking new project no database, no code, everything is you know, completely new. Most people are dealing with legacy stuff. They're dealing with existing systems. And source control is difficult. I don't want to you to think that if you buy tool X or you know, whatever, that you're going to be OK. Source control is so easy, off you go. Source control is very hard because source control requires process discipline. All changes go through source control. That means everything has to go into source control to start with, and then all the work goes through source control. If you're not working through source control, automation is going to be extremely difficult. And if you can't automate, almost everything I'm talking about today is more or less a waste of your time. You have to be able to hit automation for this stuff to work. And the way to start automation is to get your database into source control right alongside your app code. Also test data has to be put in there. Now, test data can be put in several ways, and we can, we can also talk about the different kinds of data. Static data should just go right into source control. So all that silly lookup stuff like country list or you know, state province list or something along those lines, those can go right into your source control system. But a more dynamic set of data, production data, that's got to come from someplace else. But it's still a part of the source control process to find and track that data down, and and you're going to have to deal with that. But that's that's a you know, that's the hard problem. Once you've got source control implemented, then you can start talking about, um, the you know, setting up continuous integration. The continuous integration is actually shockingly simple. There's a whole slew of different tools. Um, once you do it. You're gen generally, you've got one of two kinds of builds you're going to be doing with a database. You can do a complete replace, meaning you drop the existing database and build a new one. Now, that's a, it's a, not a complete test because you actually want to have the test where you do an incremental build, where you test the script against a database with data to ensure that the data remains in place. Because again, that data can't be replaced, right? That data lives for 100 years. So we know that we have to keep that. So we're going to have to test incremental builds, but complete builds are faster. If you drop the database, do a build on the database, it's very fast. So what do you get out of that? You get the fact that your scripts are good, that the integrity of the structure is good, that all these things are good, and you can get those tests running constantly. You don't have to do refresh from production. You don't have to rebuild the database or reset the database to a previous state. A drop and recreate is going to be very fast. An incremental is going to be more accurate, but it takes longer. So if I were setting up a CI process, I would set it up in two stages. I would probably set up a complete rebuild on check-in, basically meaning every time something goes into source control, we do it one test deployment that completely rebuilds everything. Every single change in the source control fires off a database rebuild. 
Now you can you can say you know well we'll run those every five minutes every ten minutes so you collect a set of changes, but you want to run them frequently. The incremental build you know maybe twice a day, once a day maybe because it's it is more involved. It will take longer. You've got to reset from production, and then once you start doing this, you can start setting tests up against those. Now to go to a more advanced thing, then you start talking about customization of the steps and full automation on all your testing. And, and again, it's the testing and the build automation that makes this stuff work. Finally, you can start getting into setting up full on deployment, you know, up to but not including production. And that means you're going to be taking into account backups. You're going to be building in a rollback strategy. You're going to be having all these things set up so that you can um, run these things through for people in an automated fashion all the way up to production, but through a full set of testing and with an artifact coming out the other end, whether, you know, and again, depending on your tool, that's probably going to be, at least in the, in the Windows world and SQL Server world, a NuGet package, T-SQL script, or um, uh, DAC pack. So we need to get developers empowered, right? That means we've got to give them an environment that lets them work at speed. If they want to burn down the server, let them. But if we've got our databases in source control, and we can do one button, you know, deployments of our database structures and to any and any static data, then we don't have to worry about it. We give them that little sandbox environment. They burn it down. They hit the reset, and off it goes again. No problem. That way, they can move faster. Also, you need to take part in development. Instead of stopping bad deployments, instead of standing across the bridge in front of the production server, go and stand alongside your developers and help them develop properly. Get involved with what they're doing. Get involved with their choices. Educate and assist. Don't just stop. Don't say no. Say yes. Right? Get in there and help them. And then automate, 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 automate. And um, you'll notice I say clean production data. I know that the developers want production data, but there are places where they can't have it. I know that you know some of the Sarbanes-Oxley rules um, can prevent production data, and absolutely some of the new HIPAA rules will really prevent production data from coming down at the threat of prosecution um, for people who are you know bandying about people's personal data. So you're going to have to not give them real production data, you're going to give them clean production data. However you define that, that's something you set up on your own, but you're going to have to do that and you've got to be able to get it for them. And then once you've done all this stuff, you start setting up your own tests. And the thing about tests is, is that there's a whole regimen of tests that you can run. Development, integration, and QA, you're going to be able to run unit tests, integration tests, various other automated tests, and you're going to start getting deployment validation. And you'll be able to do the deployment validation all the way up to, but not including production. And you also want to be able to get to the point where you're able to do behavior validations and all kinds of other validations across the stack. But the whole concept is, is that you want to automate these processes. Everything runs through a set of scripts. Frankly, it's, you know, it's a joke I always say about ABCD. It's always be continuously delivering, right? Um, if anyone's seen the movie Glenn, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, it's always be closing. Coffee's for closers. Um, you know, coffee, coffee is for deployers, right? You only get coffee if you're able to deploy and only if you're able to deploy well, continuously, and fast. And the way you do that is practice. Every single delivery is practice. It's like doing martial arts. You throw that punch 10,000 times to arrive at that location you get to the point where you're doing things quickly, easily, and, and repeatably because you're, do, you're doing them over and over again. If you're not doing them over and over again, if the first time you're doing that deployment is at production, then you're not practicing and you won't be ready. If the first time you're in a, you know, the very, very first time you're swinging your fist is when you're in a real fight, you're not going to be ready. So you want to make sure that you've got every deployment as practice. Also, you want to fail faster. You want to fail immediately. You don't want to be partway through the race and fall flat on your face. You, you know, fall down right at the start, and then you've got plenty of recovery time. If this is right near the finish line and you're face down in the mud, that's a real problem. So you want to fail fast because it smooths the process. You've also got to test 
and then you've got to automate. Let's um, let's take a second here and just switch over and look at my server as soon as I can find it. There it is. Cool. Let's um, open an existing project. Hey, where are my projects? That's a problem. Hang on one second. There we go. All right, while, it, while that loads, the thing I want to point out is that there's several ways, not just one, several ways to get your databases in the source control. You can come in through a third-party tool, through Management Studio, and you can look at something like you know, Redgate SQL um, uh, uh, source control, but um, you know, I'm not going to even demo the product. That's just one option. Visual Studio, there we go. Visual Studio can get your databases directly into source control. If you'll notice, this is... Um, a breakdown of the movie management database I have here. You can see all the tables, you can see store procedures that I've created, and you can see that things are checked into or checked out of source control. And these things are all managed through the source control system. Right now I'm using uh, TFS Online for this project. And these things are all managed all through source control. So you have multiple options to physically get the database in the source control. And again, that's the easy part. So you've got SQL Server database tools, you've got third-party tools, but that's easy. That's the simple part. Managing it and developing against it is a process change. I'm going to talk some more about that in a minute. But that's the hard part. The easy part is the technology. The hard part is the process. Once you've got things in the source control, then you could look at something like, let's say, Team City. Now I've got a Team City project here. We'll go in and take a look at... Um, we don't need to look at the, oh, well, we can. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm allowing my movie management deployment to build a NuGet package. Uh, NuGet is a mechanism. Uh, it defines a series of XMLs for applications and databases and allows you to make deployments um, automatically through MS Build. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into the details of what NuGet is, but you guys can go look that up. But this generates a NuGet package that I can then manipulate. Let's take a look at settings here. This is a pretty simple um, continuous integration that I've got set up. Um, this is a Team City. There's also Jenkins, Bamboo. There's a whole slew of different tools you can use, and they're really simple. If you'll notice here on the left, you've got the general settings, just you know, descriptive information. You've got version control settings, so it will hook into your version control system. Then you can do build steps. You can define different steps for the build, what it's going to do. You also get to define triggers. When does this run? You know, how do you determine how this runs? Failure conditions, build features, dependencies, parameters, all that fun stuff. Let's take a look at the version control settings real quick. So you'll notice I've got a local copy of SVN subversion. Um, you can, you know, TFS works fine with this tool. Um, there's also a CI process in Visual Studio that works great with TFS, works great with uh, Git, and you can use, you know, Mercurial. Uh, SVN. If you're crazy, you can even use TFS. But basically, you can do any of these things. Once you set them up, this is just a connection to the source control system so I can figure out what's going on. I'm going to skip build steps for a second and talk about triggers. I've set up a trigger, so basically after every check-in of the project that we're looking at, I get a build. So when the check-ins occur, this build runs. And then if we take a look at the build steps, we can say I've got one that builds a database for deployment and then it de does the deployment itself. So basically what it's doing is generating that NuGet package and if that fails, you know, this will fail out and then it deploys that NuGet package to my database server and if that fails, I would get a message. The beautiful thing about like the CI process is, is that you can then have every time it fails, send the message out to the team and everyone knows the build failed. Everyone knows that we need to go in there and get some work done and, and figure out what's wrong get the integration fixed immediately rather than waiting three, six, nine months until you find out, oh gosh, this isn't going to work. We can't deploy this to production, right? Or worse yet, you deploy it to production and find out it doesn't work. We find out immediately as the code gets changed and while that code is still in the developer's head, we find out what's wrong and get fixes for it. 
and that's how that works. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. So then another set of tools you can apply is something like Octopus. There are several others along these lines too. Microsoft also has one. What this is is the ability to set up multiple things. Now, I have not built out this uh, to the full point where I want to demo it, but what I've got is I've got four servers or uh, five five servers running across the top. I've got my dev integration server, a QA server, a continuous integration server, staging and production. Um, probably not the order in which things would occur, probably dev integration and then continuous integration or dev integration and QA integration together, but think of, you know, think about it any way you want. And then I've got my project movie management. The whole idea of a, of a deployment manager like this is this can track and automate deployment processes. Now this is after you've gotten to the point where you're very comfortable with CI, with a CI process, then you can implement this. And this process allows you to build in multiple steps. Let's go into the process. Let's look at add step. And here we go. This deploys NuGet packages, which is why one of the reasons I use NuGet packages because I like to use Octopus. Um, you can run PowerShell scripts. You can send emails. You can deploy um, to Windows Azure directly up to the cloud server so you can run FTP processes. The main point I want to point out here is to run PowerShell script. Because I've got PowerShell, what I can do is any level of automation I need to. If I want to run a restore from a production server first, clean the data, then run my deploy process against that you know, clean tested database, and then validate that that deploy ran through a series of, of commands to run testing scripts, I can do all that through PowerShell. I've got full control of a multi-stage process, as many stages as I need it to be. So it's not just about deploying a script or generating a T-SQL script. It's about automating the process. It's about implementing mechanisms around PowerShell. And so that's what this tool does for you. It's pretty cool. And, there, and again, there are several. Microsoft has one. Um, there's other ones besides Octopus. They're all pretty, they're, you know, they're largely very similar in, in theme. Its implementation details are, are slightly different. Any questions so far? Let's see. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, there is a question. Uh, they want to know what is Team City. Um, uh, Team Team City is a continuous integration software. Let's switch back to it real quick. Okay. Let's it's see. um, who makes it? I always forget the name of the company. Here, help. Should show <laughs> what it's. <a> <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't remember who makes it. Anyway, Team City is a continuous integration software. There's, um, there's, like I said, there's Jenkins is also a continuous integration software. Uh, Bamboo is also a continuous integration software. And if we go back to Visual Studio real quick, um, there's actually uh, a lot of people are commenting. It's made by JetBrains. JetBrains, yes, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, so. everyone. Good job. There's actually a CI process you can start um, through uh, Visual Studio. Um, so you, you're, you know, you've got lots and lots of options as far as a CI continuous integration tool and continuous integration tooling. Um, that, that's pretty straightforward. Any others? Yeah. Um, let's see. Does Microsoft? Let's see. What is the name of the Microsoft tool for deployment? Oh gosh, they've changed the name twice, and I don't remember the new one now. Uh, I'll have to look that up. I, I'm so sorry. I've I've forgotten. Okay. Um, it, it's it's you you can I I think it's something ridiculous like Microsoft Deployment Manager or something. <laughs> it's, it's, it's yeah it's yeah, I, I think it's so simple is why I can't keep it straight. <laughs> I just got a, a a comment here. MS Deploy. MS Deploy. deploy. So. Wait no MS. Oh yeah it is it's MS Deploy. It's MS Build is the right MS Deploy. That's it. Gosh, I can't can't believe I forgot that one. Okay, let's see. I'll I'll give you one more here. And you'll notice it, it looks a lot like Octopus. Let's see. Our problem with development is with the permission differences between the environments, oh, and yeah. they're they're asking for some samples or examples of testing of build when you reach those problems permissions between development and different environments. Right. Let's see if I can get to where I need to get to. 
real quick. I don't have an example prepped, but I can show you where I um, where how I dealt with it if I can find it. Where is it? There's a place here to put in pre and post deployment scripts, and in uh, Visual Studio, and that's one of the things that I did was um, I put in um, pre and post deployment scripts so that the ah there we go pre bit pre build post build. Um, and then run post build on successful or always. Those allowed me to set up different security settings um, independent of the database settings. Generally what I would do is I would drop the security, do the full database deployment, and then reapply the correct security for the server that I was applying to. Um, that did require some, some odd changes and whatnot, but it was the only way I could get to because dev, you know, I, I, I basically exposed the developers and let them have as much permission as they could. But QA, we didn't give them that kind of access. We had, we had to clamp them down. However, there was the QA team had a certain level of access, um, but then that level of access did not extend out in the staging and, and production. So again, you had to you know had to keep clamping down the security as you went along. That's one mechanism. Another mechanism would be if you are using um, deployment, you know, MS Deploy or Octopus or one of the others, if you were to add a step. Again, remove the security, do the deployment, add the security back in. That's another mechanism you could do to, to ensure that you've got the right security in place for a given environment. As a matter of fact, this is probably a better way to do it since you've got environment controls that you can set up and, and control you know, through here in, instead of you know, being dependent upon just simply you know, a script with an if-then statement. You could have a very targeted script for each environment. Um, so that would be one mechanism to solve that too. matter of fact, that, honestly, that would be my preferred mechanism. Any more? Oh, okay, sure. Um, let's see. I saw we got one. more to go, but I, I just thought we'd clear it. Usually after the tools, people have questions. Yeah, well, there's quite a <laughs> few coming in, and I'm just, um, is there any tools available for unit testing that T-SQL code like Redgate SQL test? We need, they're looking for free ones, basically. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's what they said. Okay, well, T-SQL T is an open source um, T-SQL unit testing environment. So that's what they're asking for, uh, is T-SQL T. The Redgate tool that you're mentioning is only a wrapper on top of T-SQL T. So you can get your own T-SQL T and go to town on it. Okay. Um, here's hey, one more. Got, got, got the answer. Cool. Um, they're asking you to discuss a little bit about branching and source control and how it affects the <laughs> CI process. Oh, somebody wants to ask the hard question. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> branching is the hard question. That's, that's <laughs> the, the story I am painting is the easy approach. Straight through, everything's fine. Branching makes things more difficult. <sighs> Basically, when I've, when I've had to deal with branching in databases, what I've had to do is, is set up either or both um, additional you know, virtual machines or additional databases or, or both um, in order to support the branch. And so the, the code branches and then I create another database, another location for that database to go, whether it's just a separate database on an existing server or a new server um, and, and new databases. Uh, it, it's a new location. Uh, it's the only way I've been able to make it work successfully. Um, I have not heard about anyone doing a uh, doing it another way yet, um, but but I'm open to learning. Um, but the, but the way I've had to do it is I create another environment, and so that means um, a second dev integration, a second QA, possibly even a second staging. Generally, not a second staging. Usually, once you're up to the staging point, um, it's it's a single staging environment. Staging reflects production. It's also called pre-prod for those who don't know. Um, either 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 one, pretty much interchangeable. But that represents production, and so once you're up to that point, uh, you don't need a second environment because that sort of is the second environment for production. But but for QA and dev, um, generally what I've had to do with branching is create a second environment. And also, by the way, speaking of which, for those who don't know what branching is, um, source control systems allow you to version the code. Branching takes the code and s separates it off so you have two completely different paths two completely different sets of code. So generally done for, you know, think about it like this. You've got 
new development and you've got bug fixes to existing development. Those, those are two common branches. There's a million other ones, but the two very common branches is new development and you know bug fixes. And those things will be very separate, um, but have to get merged together on a regular basis. So, so you need that have one database for the branch of of new development and one database for the branch of bug fixing, and and then off you go. And that's generally how I've solved that one. All right, I'm going to keep going. If okay. We have time at the end. We'll answer a few more questions. All right. So all of this, the tooling is easy, right? I, I mean. Granted, we didn't do full-on deployments because we just don't have much time. But but the tooling is really simple. It just is. It's it's not hard. Uh, like I said, I showed you. You know, Visual Studio connects right in. The hard part is is that we've got to get DBAs working with devs. You know, I get it. You've got to protect the business data. There's no questions asked, right? I I know what your job is. I I, I do your job. I I'm on your side. But you've got to temper that protection thing with the ability to deliver functionality. We have to support the develop developers. But that's not to say that the devs can't work with the DBAs. Yeah, I get it. You know, I've I've talked with developers and and I've, you know met with many of them, and they and they tell me you know I know more about the business needs than you do. Uh, you know, you could argue maybe that's true, maybe it's not. But let's say it's true. Fine, educate me. Don't isolate me. Don't wall me off. I need to know how the business works too. So if you've got more information, that's great. Educate me, and then I can assist you better rather than walling me off and make it so I can't assist you at all. But that's even that's easy. You, we can believe it or not. Devs and DBAs actually share most of a common language. We have a few differences, but mostly we're the same. Project management is the hard part. We've got to get project management to think of operations as a part of development. This concept of DevOps is vital. And the thing is is that deployment is a part of development, right? It's not simply I've got code that works, I'm done, I rock. Deployment, it must go out the door. And you've got to account for release 1.1. I get it. Release 1.0 is simple. Right, and coding for release 1.1 is simple, and deploying re release 1.0 is simple. That 1.0 release is the simplest one in the world. The 1.1, where you've got data retention, where you've got existing code, where you've got people on the system, that has to be part of the deployment and development management philosophy, and it has to be part of the process, and it is not premature optimization, as I heard people call it. No, we just got to get out the door. We'll optimize later. That is not optimization. That is a part of operations, and development is a part of operations, as much as operations is a part of development. And then finally, you've, you've got to have data retention. We can't just throw it away. I mean, it, you know, again, 100-year-old data. Just remember, 100-year-old data. So that means you've got to make changes to the workplace. Because technology just doesn't work without making the changes to the workplace. You've got to be able to make those changes. So we need to empower developers. We've got to bring DBAs onto development teams. You've got to get management buy-in. And then finally, management has to get out of the way. And that's hard, frankly. There's just it, it's you know, everybody wants to control everything. I get it. I understand it. But we've got to be able to, you know, make the developers do more, get the DBAs, get the ops and development teams working together. Remember, DevOps is not developers taking over operations, nor is it operations taking over development. It's developers and operations working together, right? Finding all those common paths, creating lean paradigm, right? Getting you know, focus on the customer, getting things out the door, optimize the whole. We've got to do all those things. But without management buy-in and management getting out of our way, it's going to be hard to do. Now, other companies are doing this. I want to just give you a quick overview of a few companies that have been doing this. Now, this is Boxon. It's a small company. So small, they've got a single developer. But I really like this example. Uh, I like it now because someone else pointed this out to me. I, I have to give credit where credit's due. It shows that one developer can shoot himself in the foot 
and one developer can take advantage of these things. So what their initial process was, and, and I love this one because it's deploying to production was scary. I love it because I'm the scary DBA, so it, it's pretty cool that their production deployments were scary. And they had nothing in version control, and they had a two-hour window to get deployments done, and they would just do them, right? It was like they had two hours, and they would start trying to deploy them. And they had, you know, they, they couldn't get quiet periods. That It was crazy, right? They had lots of issues. So what they do? Uh, deployments are less scary now. They're using unfuddle. So when they get tickets, the tickets go into this thing called unfuddle. The ticket numbers are assigned to SVN and Team City. And so when they make code changes through source control, through the subversion system, it it's able to track things back to unfuddle. So they've got a coordination between their tickets and their, their code changes, and everything's going through source control. And the or authority of all their builds is source control. They've implemented Team City, and they're using that. When they check in changes, they get immediate responses. It, it tells them if the build fails, and then the build package is up into a NuGet file, and the NuGet file gets deployed. And that's how they do their deployments now. It's, it's a massive change in everything they've done. And it's, and it's one guy. Another example, Move With Us. It's a large, uh, much larger company. Um, that you know, they're putting pretty heavy load on databases. Their initial process was, uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. They tried to go virtual. They did try to go virtual control, but um, because they weren't maintaining it, because they weren't doing the hard thing, and, and version control is hard. Never, ever, ever forget that. They started just using email as version control. Oh my God. And they would do hot fixes directly on an integration server, sometimes, sometimes directly on production servers. They, it would take them a day to get release updates, and that day was spent just, you know, does this work? Does this work? Does this work? And just this long, long list of fire, fire you know, just long, long, long list of firefighting things. Completely insane. So what have they done now? Every developer has a copy of the database. They've gone. They're using Subversion, right? I, again, I'm not a sales guy for Subversion. I, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a free, it's a free tool, so a lot of people use it. Um, I, I prefer TFS personally, or Git. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Git, becoming more so all the time. Anyway, um, they're also using Team City uh, as automatic, you know, compile the changes that they check in. When they get a new Git package, um, that gets deployed to Dev on demand. And if problems are detected, they return it to dev and fix. So they've actually got it. So they're doing their deployments through QA now in a completely automated fashion. And that allows them to do multiple changes every single day, validate those changes, and get them out the door. And, and it's, you know, it's a real change in their process. Uh, another one, Practice Fusion. It's a health record company. And um, very large scale. Uh, not that many developers, but, but three DBAs, 10 developers. Um, but, but a huge company. Now, what did they do? They just built everything by hand. Um, everything was not always version controlled. As soon as you say it's not always version controlled or not everything is version controlled, you might as well say it's not version controlled because that means you're, you've got manual stuff that you're going to be doing. And so what they did was is they just opened up you know, a couple of dozen files in SSMS and ran things. Um, they would you know, send emails back and forth if they hit problems. And they did some smoke testing on deployments, um, but they were finding all kinds of drift. So things were getting deployed straight to production, and they weren't in part of any deployment script. Um, they weren't part of other environments. I mean, it's just this constant, you know, just this incredible chaos of, sy of systems. What did they do? Um, again, <laughs> subversion. It's kind of funny. This is the same one used over and over again. Um, and they used Jenkins, not Team City. And... Um, they went through the same process, build on and check in, um, caught those issues before they went to production, and were able to you know get things back out. They did have to build custom scripts for replication. Um, that question hadn't come up, or or at least you hadn't read it to me yet, but it comes up frequently. What about replication? Replication makes this hard. Replication makes this very hard because what you have to do is you have to have custom scripts that break replication down and rebuild it after the deployment's done. If you're doing lots and lots of replication, plan for that. Uh, plan for that is going to be one of the tougher part of the system, um, as tough as getting uh, source control implemented, uh, just so you know. And, and in fact, actually tougher, because replication is a, it's tooling tough, not process tough. Um, so just so you know. All right, so in summary, 
and that, that was three companies that have, that have already done this, you know, and you guys get some idea of how they do it. So let's get rid of the friction, right? Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Let's just let's just stop this whole dev versus DBA crap. It, it, it's, it's a waste of our time. It's a waste of our efforts. Let's end it. Um, let's get on lean. You know, I mean, it's it's the lean methodology, it's the lean focus. It's not that 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 you know the lean development paradigm, but but just the the very common sense ideas that we're going to optimize the whole. You know, that we're going to empower the team. We're going to make sure people need get what they need to get the job done. We're going to get through the four stages. We're going to do source control. We're going to do build automation, CI, and then try for CD. Right? Automate the builds. Get the CI process. Get the continuous deployment process. And always be continuous deploying, deploying before you get your coffee. Change your philosophy. Change your workplace. Hopefully, I hit these goals. Now, before we go on to questions, because I'm, I'm trying to wrap up a little quickly, just so we have a little bit of time for questions, um, I want to mention um, a book that you guys ought to read. No, not continuous delivery, although you, sh you could read that too. It's a good read. Uh, and the goal is also a good read. But I absolutely recommend you read The Phoenix Project. It is a novel about IT, and uh, I, I, you know, every single time I say it, every single time I say it's a novel about IT, I feel a little bit dirty when I say it. But the fact is, it's an awesome read. Not because it's a good book; it's actually a really crappy book, but it's a great read because it's an amazing parable about how to do development, how to do deployment, how to do DevOps, because it's a business issue. It's not simply a technical issue. The technical problems are clear and easy. And we've got tools that support it, whether using you know, uh, Visual Studio and Microsoft tooling, or you're looking at some of the third party, the free tools. Awesome. Great. Go for it. Any of the tooling will help you get through the door. It's the process that you have to tackle. And this novel, this parable about DevOps is absolutely worth your time. Um, I finished it in a day. It's a bad book, right? It's a really bad read, I swear to God. But I finished it in a day because I'm going, hey, I work with these guys. I know that guy. I mean, it was just this horrible thing of like this, this recognition of the issues that I've run into in my, in my past. And so, I mean, I ripped right through it. It was a very, very inspiring read. So I, I, I strongly recommend it. The other, other things are, are good. The other things are interesting. But, but that one I'm a huge fan of. So with that, let's open it up for questions. Okay. Um, we have a question. This is really just a, a quick question. They, they want to know about the slides. Um, will, will you uh, give the slides out? I believe the slides are on SlideShare already, but if not, okay. I'll go check on that today and put them up there. Okay. Because they really should be there. All right, great. Um, here's a question. Is it a good practice to go for a shared development model, which each developer works on a local instance and keeps, which keeps things with a centralized database? Okay, so you're saying every developer has their own instance? Yes, that's, that's not what, a that's not a shared development model. That's that's a sandbox or isolated development model, and that's my preferred model. Um, I, I prefer to work that way because you get. Um, there's no other way to put it. When I'm playing, when I'm learning new technologies, when I'm fooling around with the, with the box, I'll burn it down. I, I've, I've accidentally, I, well not accidentally, I, I intentionally did it, I just didn't realize what it would do. I set my server memory down to one meg one time. Um, and, and I didn't know that it would prevent the thing from starting ever again. Um, but if I had done that to a shared development environment where there was multiple developers on, um, you know, I would not. I I would be less popular than I am now, and, and I'm not terribly popular, right? Um, you know, I'm a DBA. I say no a lot, um, so I, I I'm not in favor of the shared development methodology. I'm in favor of what you described, which is that there's there's everybody's off on their own. Now, you did mention coming back to a central database server. I call that a dev integration environment. So it's basically a pre-QA, if you will, like like almost like pre-production. Um, and I'm in favor of that as well because it ensures the developers can catch um, cross integrity issues before it goes to the QA team. Um, not only does that help the QA team get their job done more efficiently, but it makes the development team look better. 
So yeah, if you can do that, I, I agree with doing it. Just don't develop in that shared environment. Just use it as a test bed. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question here um, about DAC packs, gotchas, issues. What do you think about them? Um, they're functional. First off, there are, the issues around DAC packs are fairly well documented. The main issue is that if you have a change that is going to cause data loss, um, it can't be deployed through the DAC pack. So that is a limit that, that the DAC packs run into. And so you, there's ways around it. You can force it to make that change and then you'll lose data. Um, probably not the, the right approach. Or you've got to add in a second step with T-SQL to, to make the, you know, the additional changes that you have to make. So you isolate off the ones that are there and then you make in those extra changes. Um, to me, I think that's the, the, the big shortcoming in DAC packs. Um, other than that, they, they work pretty well. Um, I do like the fact that you can un, un, unpack it and it's T-SQL inside so you can actually see what's going on there. You can do the same thing with NuGet, but it's um, XML inside so it's a little uglier. Um, but um, you know, it's you know, there's nothing there's nothing inherently bad about DAC packs. It's just uh, you know, as an artifact, I think I think it's you know, it's a little bit short because you have to add multiple other artifacts to it to make it work. Okay, um, I'm gonna wrap it up now. If that's okay. all right with you, Grant. That's fine and with me. Thank, thanks everybody for for coming and thanks thanks for having me. Oh, Grant, thank you for coming. Um, I, ha I have all your comments and your emails and I'll be sh emailing that to Grant and share them so first of all I'd like to thank everyone for taking time out today because you know we're all busy working um, and coming to the webinar and I really appreciate Grant taking time because I worked with him a couple months to get this plan and we made it happen which is great so um, I'm gonna, if y'all have any other questions email I'll make sure that uh, Grant gets it and I'll uh, make sure you get your response back thank you everyone and I'm gonna shut down the webinar now Thank you, Grant. Thank you.